the past few decades, we as a society have become comfortable with having medical devices called prostheses implanted in various parts of our bodies. For example, uh, cardiac pacemakers near our hearts, as well as artificial hips. And in more recent decades, we've also become increasingly comfortable with having other prostheses implanted, such as prosthetic legs, prosthetic hands, and prosthetic knees. And what I'm here to share with you today is that this idea has now reached the brain. And it's reached the brain in order to help a large number of people who are suffering from neurological diseases and injuries. Now, how in the world is this even possible? Well, it really depends on two recent advances. The first is neuroscience. We now understand more about the brain and how the language of the brain works, and just enough that we can start having conversations with it, direct conversations to help people. The second major advance is technology. We can now make sensors and low-power electronic circuits that we can actually go ahead and medically implant directly in the brain. And in the coming few minutes, I'll try to describe what these systems look like, how they're working, and what I think is a fantastic potential that is really on the near-term horizon. So we know enough to get started. And we know enough to get started with, uh, first of all, writing information into the brain. And what I'm meaning by this is that often the problem is that we can't take into our brain the types of things that we need to. So for example, if we're blind, it's now possible to have a small camera mounted on one's glasses, take in that video image, and process it to put a little electrical pulses on a little chip that sits at the back of your eye on the retina, and thereby stimulate your eye as it normally is stimulated, or very close to it. And what this does is allow people that are profoundly hard of sight to see light and dark patches, maybe even some general shapes, and be able to start working through the world. Another example is the cochlear implant for profoundly deaf people. And this works similarly with a little microphone that picks up on sounds, conversations with friends and loved ones, and goes ahead and converts those signals into other little stimulation patterns that are delivered to the inner ear called the cochlea. And this is so powerful that you can even learn spoken language if you're born without the ability to hear. A third example is Parkinson's disease. And as many of you know, this leaves a profound tremor. And what you can now do is implant a small cardiac pacemaker-like unit in the heart, and electrical signals are sent up through a wire to an electrode that's implanted in your brain. And that small electrical current disrupts something that's going wrong, some aberrant neural activity, and that tremor literally stops. It's just like magic. And it's starting to reveal how as we learn more and more about the brain, we might be able to help people more and more profoundly. As a final example, epilepsy. So you could be driving along, as many of you know, and have a seizure, and that could really dramatically impact your life in many other ways, of course. What if we could put a system directly on your brain or in your brain that could detect a seizure about to happen, make a decision, and then go ahead and disrupt that seizure from ever happening? Now, these first three systems are FDA approved and helping hundreds of thousands of people today. People are walking around with these devices, these prostheses in their brain. And the fourth and final system, the epilepsy system, is just about to finish clinical trials and will hopefully soon be available to help people as well. Now that's, or that's writing information into the brain. What about reading information out of the brain, sort of the flip side of the coin? And why might we want to do this? Well, we might want to read out arm movement information to help paralyze people. Okay? People with paralysis number about 6 million in the United States alone. And as you can see on the pie chart, the reasons for this paralysis range from stroke through spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, and other diseases such as amyotropic lateral sclerosis, ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. Now, as important as these statistics are, nothing replaces reminding ourselves of why this is so important, and that is the face of the people we're attempting to help. And this is a picture of Christopher Reeve. As many of you know, Christopher was thrown from his horse in the mid-90s, broke his neck, 
and from that day forward was no longer able to walk, to move his arms, and perhaps less appreciated, was no longer able to speak clearly due to the need for assistance in breathing. And how might we help somebody like Christopher Reeve, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago in really no better condition than during, uh, right after his injury? Well, we might be able to help if we could eavesdrop in on the brain activity where presumably in his brain he still wishes to move. He still intends and desires to move. So if we could pick up those signals and simply decode them, we could drive prosthetic arms or stimulate his paralyzed muscles or move a computer cursor on a screen so he could type out messages just like many of you are doing on laptops and touchpads and computers right now. Okay? <laughs> So here's an example of a system uh, that has been developed in the past couple of years to help a person suffering from brainstem stroke who is unable to move. As you can see, she's sitting here, a little electrode array that I'll describe more in a moment about the size of your pinky fingernail was implanted on the surface of her brain. And during the time of this clinical trial testing, a little amplifier is plugged in. There's ways to get away from that plug-in. Don't pay too much attention or worry about that part of it. The signals come out to computers, and those signals from the brain are translated into commands to move the robotic arm. And what she is doing, what she's just done, in fact, is she's reached out with the arm, picked up a bottle of coffee, brought it to her mouth, drank some coffee and put it back down, and she loves coffee. This is the first time she was able to do that independently on her own in many years, and as you can tell from her facial expression, she was very happy, okay? That sense of independence is really very key, okay? Here's another example where the same type of system is in operation, but now it's hooked up to a fancier arm. This arm is now looking more like a natural arm. It has fingers, you can move the fingers individually, you're able to pick up blocks, you're able to move things around, and you can imagine that we're working up towards the ability to do uh, so-called tasks of daily living, the types of things that we all want to do, feed ourselves, brush our teeth, and so forth. Again, to restore that semblance of independence. And as a third example uh, of a clinical trial participant that we're working with right here at Stanford, this is a person suffering from Lou Gehrig's disease, again, unable to move or speak clearly, or that will also progress. It's a progressive disease. You sit in front of a computer screen, and a target, this green dot that you see, not unlike an icon on your desktop, comes up, and instead of reaching out and moving a mouse to move a cursor to hit it, just by thinking about it alone, just by thinking about moving that white computer cursor, it can be brought out and hit the green target. And you can imagine how you could then interact just by thinking about it without lifting a muscle, without, because you can't, do anything that you or I can normally do with a computer. That would restore the ability to communicate with loved ones, write emails, communicate with physicians, and so forth. Okay, now let me describe a little bit more about how this is possible before he's showing you a couple of quick movies of how these systems are working. So let's take ourselves back in time about 500 years. And this is a map of the world as it existed about 500 years ago, where not everything was fully understood, right? Particularly North and South America looks a little squished up. I'm not exactly sure California is even well represented there, okay? But nevertheless, there was a general understanding of what was happening in the world, and let's imagine that we took a ship over to the new land, and we'd been there a few times before, and we had developed a phrase book, and we had this phrase book with us so that we could start having a conversation with people that we encounter. And of course, we're not fluent, we don't know everything that's being said, but we know some phrases, so we might know uh, what is being said roughly, we might help be able to say a few phrases. So in that way, when you go to a new land, you have to get by with what you know at the time. And by analogy, the new land that we are facing is the brain. We certainly do not know the full language of the brain, but we know something. This is where neuroscience has brought us as a field in the past several decades. Now, we don't take a ship over to the brain. We take an electrode, shown as the very spine electrical um, electrode, and it comes to rest very close to an individual cell in the brain called a neuron, and what this electrode picks up on is a little electrical pulses. And these electrical pulses called action potentials are how neurons communicate with each other 
and represent information. So what might we hear? Well, what we might hear is uh, voltage as a function of time. We might see that in some period of time, there's a lot of these sharp deflections, these action potentials, and maybe our clinical trial participant was thinking about moving the arm to the left. So if we see a lot of these deflections, we would know that our participant's wanting to move to the left. And when we see no pulses, that could mean that she wanted to move to the right, for example. Okay? So one neuron is really important. It tells us a lot about your desire to move to the left or to the right. But if we want to know about up versus down, we'd need to listen to another neuron. And if we want to know in versus out, we'd need to listen to a third neuron and so forth. And it turns out that remarkably, despite there being billions of neurons all participating in these conversations, by just listening to roughly 100 or maybe a couple of hundred of these neurons, we can tell a lot about how to move an arm out, grasp objects, and take them back. So what we do is we implant, again, this small silicon computer chip technology-based electrode array. It's very small. It looks sort of onerous when I blow it up big on the screen there, but it's, again, about the size of a baby aspirin. And away we go. So that's the neuroscience side of it. Let me unpack a little bit more that second topic I was telling you about, the technology. And of course, this is very relatable to many of us in the audience. We're in the heart of Silicon Valley in Palo Alto here. And what you're seeing on this penny is an in complete entire brain prosthesis all in one small package. At the bottom, you're seeing the electrode array I was just showing you with 100 tiny electrodes. Right on top of that, you see a very thin silicon chip where all the electronics are processing that language of the brain into these signals to move a robotic arm. And on top of it, you see a little coil, and that's an antenna, of course, just like we have on our cell phones that allows information to be sent out of the brain through the skin and allows power to go in. Now, as wonderful as this is, this is merely the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more that's going to be possible. We don't have to drive that. Silicon Valley is driving that. There's going to be better wireless powering, lower power integrated circuits so you don't even need as much power. That's important because power is heat. You don't want heat in your brain, okay? Better mathematical algorithms. These are the decoding algorithms that translate the language of the brain into arm movements, right? This is my little shout out that math matters, okay? <laughs> and also so I won't have 15 PhD students angry at me on Monday morning. <laughs> and finally, those 100 electrodes, there's no reason we can't make 1,000 electrodes or 10,000 electrodes if we can make each one of those electrodes smaller and smaller and smaller, and this is the subject of so-called nanoscience that many of you are hearing about. If we can make things at the atomic scale instead of these larger scales, we can get a lot more information out of the brain by virtue of um, listening to more neurons. Okay, so enough background. How does this work? Let me show you two movies, and we'll be done. Okay, so this is a movie of the screen in front of our uh, FDA phase one clinical trial here at Stanford, uh, this ALS participant. And the green target is where uh, the participant would like to move the white cursor. We implant this electrode array that you've now seen once. We bring out these neural signals that you've also seen. We decode using our mathematical algorithms, the language of the brain into control signals for moving that cursor. Go to this location at this time, go to this location at this time, and so forth. Those are the commands you need to send to a cursor or a robotic arm, and this is how it works when she tries to move this white computer cursor. You can see, and this is playing in real time, you can see that the cursor is able to go out fairly straight, fairly quickly, and come to stop, rest, on that target, and that's how it's selected. Okay? So that's pretty good if you can't communicate in any other way, okay? Now, is that as well as we think we can do? No, we think we can do better, and I also like to give you a better picture in your mind in terms of what that could look like if you hook it up to a keyboard. So for that, we turn to the research that we do in our laboratory with animal models, and what you're now looking at is, again, a computer screen sitting in front of an animal, and now you're seeing 36, six by six, yellow uh, circles, and any one of those yellow circles could be a target. Why 36? Well, there's 26 letters in the alphabet, and there's another roughly 10 numbers, okay? 
zero through nine. So you could put all the information that's essential on your keyboard into this pattern. Now, by turning one of those targets blue, or a different color in this case, that indicates where the white cursor should be moved, again, by thought alone. Just by thinking about moving the white cursor to hit the colored target, we can do so. Now, our animals do not know letters, okay? <laughs> if I could teach them that, actually, if I could teach an elephant that, as per one of the previous talks, that would be very cool. Uh, that would be great, but they don't, of course, so I'm just overlaying these letters and these numbers only for the purpose of helping you see what we could liken each location to, just as a keyboard is nothing more than a physical mapping of keys, okay? So this is how the system works. You can see that the target is able to again, or the cursor is able to again move fairly quickly in a fairly straight line, and by coming to rest on the target for about a half a second, it's like hitting the key, and what's happening when a key is hit is that those letters are being translated down to the lower part of the screen, and as you can see, uh, this animal is saying, hello world, my name is Jenkins, okay? Now, in conclusion, brain prostheses are arriving now. This may surprise many people. There are thousands and thousands of people walking around in this country, this in the world today, with brain implants. And that, again, is just the tip of the iceberg. There's going to be, as we learn more about neuroscience and advance the technology, just an explosion of possibilities. In the near future, this is what might be possible, we believe, which is to go ahead and read out from some area of the brain, as I've shown you. Let's call that area A. And what the prosthesis would do is it would read out area A, for example, move a prosthetic arm, but now when you reach that object, you also want to feel it. Well, we can certainly put sensors on the robotic arm, and that information from the sensors can actually be written back into the brain. And that sense of touch is what Alison Okamura, who will be speaking in a few talks from now, will be describing more, the sense of touch. And we can write that back into the area of the brain that's normally responsible for the sense of touch, area C here. So we can do this closed loop control and really keep making that prosthetic arm feel more and more natural. Now what's on the slightly farther future, but still very imaginable, people are working on these types of systems, we are as well. Well, let's imagine that now we have an area, let's call it area B, that has received some sort of injury. For example, a stroke. So the reason you may not be able to move or be able to recall certain words is that this area of the brain has been damaged. Well, if we can record, read out the area just before that area, if we can read out from area A, now what the prosthesis can do is mimic area B in electronic circuits. If we know enough about what that brain area was doing through our basic neuroscience, why can't we just simulate it, make a simulation of it, and then take the output from area B that's no longer with us and write it back into area C, which is where area B would want to go. So instead of going from A to B to C, if B is damaged, just do a bypass around B by replacing that functionality in the electronic circuit. So this is what we're very excited about. We're very excited that brain prostheses are starting to help in a profound way many people right now. And in terms of what the future potential might be, we believe the sky is the limit. Thank you. <laughs>